sort of finish the today's day. Um, it's always a peculiar thing to be the last person to talk. Um, because on one hand, you feel as if everything's been said. And on the other hand, you feel as if you don't know where to begin with all that has been said. Um, so it's an honor to be sitting between these two righteous individuals, Robin Kelly and Rabab. Um, and so I kind of want to give a little bit of me, hi, my name's Donna Benekat, and a little bit of what I thought about today. I kind of want to start with what brought us all together, which is this delegation. Um, and this is not the first time that I've been on the receiving end of a Revolve delegation. Um, and it's always a pleasure and an honor, because Revolve knows that I can't really move out of Palestine very easily, so Revolve brings the rest of the world to me. That's why you do it, right, Revolve? It's just for me. Um, because really, one of, the things, one of the things that people don't always recognize is that it's hard for us to move out of Palestine. Um, and as much as we want to be in conversation with people, um, and, and the kind of conversations that were fostered or began or continued throughout today, it's difficult because there is this lack of movement um, that's an, that is an integral part of what it means to be a scholar in Palestine. There are different layers of it. Different people um, are, are categorized in different ways. But all of us are sort of isolated. And so I think being on the receiving end of these delegations is awesome to break that kind of isolation. Um, so I kind of, I hope that Rabab in her final statement will talk a little bit about what motivates these annual trips. Who's here and who was not able to be here. And the story that I know about Robin is that he's actually tried, he's a very, he's got a, this schedule of his, he's tried to be on these Rabab delegations before, but it just hasn't worked out. So I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to hear about sort of step back from today and sort of think about what, how this is a much bigger process of what you're doing. Um, and so that was um, one of the things that I was thinking about before today started was that, it, in all humility I'm saying this, it's that Robin is sitting next to me. And the first time I met Robin Kelly was in 2012 when we brought in for a U.S. ACPI delegation. And that was when I was, uh, myself and Majid Shada who had to leave, but he was here earlier today, were playing the Rabab role, and we were being the organizer, and it is, it's a headache, it's horrible, and it's hard, and it's wonderful, um, and it was the first time that I actually had interactions with Robin, and, and we had such great conversations, he just had such insight um, about what struggle means, um, and about sort of, he, ins he sort of, I don't think he knows that he did this, but he planted a seed in my head about the word common and commonality and shared. Um, and I had told him the story about my, any, my visa drama, about how I was denied entry into Palestine and how I had to work really hard to come back and how ever since then it's been hard to leave. And I told him, I admitted to him that I was almost ashamed to talk about it because there's so many far greater injustices that are being done to the Palestinian people and the Palestinian body. And he said something really brilliant at the time. He said, I don't even have to think about it like a plate. Everybody brings what they bring into that plate. You can't not bring what you have because it's shared. Um, and that is stuck in my head ever since then. Six years that's been in my head. Um, he gifted me his book Freedom Dreams at the time as well. And I read the book and I, <laughs> I didn't know what to do with it. Um, Anger, I understand. Sadness is debilitating, but I understand. But his sense of love and humanity in that book was something I couldn't wrap my brain around. Um, I didn't know how to deal with, with how he was talking about a humanistic understanding of resistance. And I've read it and I've taught it since then. And I'm still sort of trying to come to terms with it. Um, I can't say that I have, but I've followed a lot of Robin's work since then. And that sort of brings me, in, brings me into... To, to what I see as the genealogy of this, because it takes us into Black Lives Matter. Um, and we saw from our comrades from Blacks for Palestine just sort of how those connections are being made more organic. But Black Lives Matter is my generation in some ways, and it's the people that came up with me in, 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 in obviously in my accent, is in the cities of, of Turtle Island. Um, this accent is Chicago if you can't place it. So um, it's, um, 
that I was politicized in that environment. And, and that means that I understand what the Black Panthers are, and that means I understand what Black radicalism is, and, um, and, and that means that I understand where Black Lives Matter came from. Um, and that also means that I understand when in, the, in, in their literature they put Palestine central, and they use the word genocide. I understood why, um, I understood how, and I understood that that was a result of something as much as it was a beginning of something. Um, it's a longer process. And then I started to sort of understand that humanity, right? That these are, that's it, that is his genealogy. Um, and the video that we all saw today of Blacks for Palestine, I have to say that one of the questions that you guys asked is what can we bring from your struggle back? And I'd like to, with all due respect, say that it's our struggle. Um, because it's not, that's the point, right? That's the point of what I think Rabob was saying about the indivisibility of justice, is that that's why Robin is here. That's why there were. That's why Rabab comes every year. That's what. That's what Palestine means, and that is that historical connection um, with the tricontinental till today. Um, <clears throat> Palestine being a part of that is it's a political statement, but it's also a politics. So what I want to say to you is thank you, Blacks for Palestine, for translating everything that you do into Arabic. Um, very much so. For doing what you do and translating. Because this is what I was going to talk about. Because I want to talk about teaching in Palestine and teaching on Palestine. That's really important. But I actually have a different story to tell. I came here and I was told by my male dominated patriarchal, um, somewhat colonized department, and I'm sorry, we're all friends here, um, that I should teach American history. Now, that's not my area. I mean, I work on Palestine, um, I do culture, I did literature, but I didn't do American history. I did history, but it wasn't American history. So I'm like, why? And I'm like, well, you're an American. <laughs> yeah, I was greeted as an American in Palestine. That's pretty messed up. But I think it was, a, it was something that was really interesting because I, I was, I taught this course and it has become the most interesting course that I teach out of all my courses. Because I get to teach a course on the history of settler colonialism, on the history of racism, and on the history of capitalism. And that's what my class has become. And it's a really interesting class. And we start with Columbus. We go from 1492 till today, or as close till today as I can get. And, um, and I always start with two populations that are of the utmost of importance for Palestinian students to have, to be in conversation with. Blacks for Palestine have helped me have that conversation with black America, and Standing Rock helped me have that conversation with indigenous, um, with indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. That has been a really important lesson for me, and I hope it's an important lesson for my students, because that's not teaching Palestine, and that's not teaching in Palestine, but it's what I can do when I teach in Palestine. And I think that's one of those things. So thank you for doing what you do, and I hope that you guys keep doing what we're doing. Just you know, deal with the fact that there's a language barrier. It's all right. That took me into sort of my own sort of yesterday when I was teaching this class. I, I, after I taught, I thought, okay, what are people going to talk about? They're going to talk about 1968, like Rabab said, but I wanted to talk about 1974 and not Arafat. Because um, in 74, Arafat sort of abandoned the secular state with his 10-point plan. And I want to talk about the Kumbaki Right Collective, Rights Collective. And I just want to quote something. It's this it's a black feminist from the Rights Collective from 1974. Um, and in their statement, and I just want I just want to quote this if you can uh, put up with me for a minute. We are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and pra practice based upon the, upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking, that the, synth the synthesis of these operations, oppressions creates the conditions of our lives. That was as true in 74 as it is in 2018. I think they use the word interlocking. We tend to use the word intersectional. Um, I think they mean somewhat similar things. So I appreciate the conversations that began today because it is these conversations that was, I was attested to at the very end of the last session, is that we don't always have answers to the questions, right? Um, I don't, 
I don't know what black indigeneity means in Palestine, but I know it's an interesting question to have asked in Palestine. Um, um, I think exploring these intersections or how these how oppressions are interlocked is part of what is our collective struggle. It is coming together with a common. It's not that we're in solidarity with each other as much as it's we are in this together. There's a difference, I think, because being in this together makes makes up at least allows me to understand how colonialism has functioned and how settler colonialism, in particular, in Palestine, has functioned. So I just want to just kind of do something really quick right now and just sum up how I imagine today. There are three main things. One is to imagine. Two is this notion of common. And three is the conversation. Those are the three main things that I think began, well, began long before today, continued today. And it's something that I do hope will continue well beyond today because those are, that's the point. That's the point of being in struggle together. Um, I do want to make a point about two things. Um, about what indigenous means in Palestine and what teaching racism means in Palestine. Um, the first point is something that I work on. It's really close to me because it's my current project and, and Linda's working on this as well, I know. Um, we're thinking in our own separate worlds, obviously, but we're thinking about what an indigenous politics means in Palestine. And I want actually brought up a question of we can't, Indigenous in Palestine is not only in relation to the land, it's also in relation to the fact that there's an active settler colonial regime here. How do you, it's not just about who happens to be here and how they're in relation, it's a constant struggle. And I think that's true. Understanding settler colonial frameworks is really important, but I also think not centering them is important. And that's what indigenous means for me in Palestine. It's a politics. It's understanding how those frameworks work, but also understanding that as history is often written, it's written from the standpoint of those hegemonic frameworks. Um, so that's the conversation that we're, into, we're, we're, we're having together. It's not that the settlers look different here as they do elsewhere. They do. There's a contextual and historical understanding. But there's also what you were saying about relation. Um, that is an indigenous relation to land. That is, by one definition, it, it's... it's, um, it's anti-colonial, obviously. So it has to be anti-capital, and capitalism has a really interesting history in Palestine. And that's something that you can teach outside of Palestine to help us collectively understand that, you know, land became a commodity in 1856 here. I mean, when there was a law when the Ottomans decided to try to become a nation state. And you can trace colonialism back until 1856. And I think those kind of conversations are really interesting to have, just like the Columbus conversation. Um, racism. I think what's really awesome and righteous about what happens, what has happened with Black Lives Matter and the kind of open conversations that have happened and the horizontal nature of those open conversations um, has been that we've had, I've been, um, I've been able to sort of observe people thinking out loud, if you will. Um, Robin and the Boston Review are big friends of mine because I, listen, I go I visit this site often and I see how we're not necessarily, there isn't, it's not a, it's not a, hedge, it's not a, a pyramid structure. It's not the sense of there's a leader who says something. It's a sense of we're trying to figure things out as we go along. And because what was presented, because Ferguson and Gaza happened sort of at that same time. It's been this conversation that's in line with Palestine. And it's, and it's because we're making the connections of what power, how power is manifested in a neoliberal age. But at the same time, I want us to always remind ourselves to not situate ourselves by where the white man is and to understand that it's not about how we relate to the white man, it's about how we relate to each other in resistance to that white man and white hege uh, hegemonic power. And the last thing that I want to say, I know that I've talked for too long, is the second panel that happened today with a bunch of professors from Beers Um, and none of whom are here right now. Uh, okay, you're here, great, thank you. Um, is that, um, what, was, what was important is that you talked about the history of teaching here, which we often forget, because people are so stuck into the Oslo mentality that people forget that Palestine existed before Oslo, which is an important thing to be reminded of. I think the conversation 
was, um, it was it's, it's a conversation that was necessary and important, but it's also a conversation that doesn't, in some ways, know how to relate to other conversations. So let me just try and take that conversation and twist it a little and make it one that's between us as well, one that's sort of a common that all of us can be part uh, can partake in. And I think it's about frameworks. I think what was happening with regards to a, imagining the possible is something that you were you were talking about in your paper. It's something that I think a lot we have to find a language, and it's important for us to find a language that is not in um, that is not in a direct reactionary mode to settler colonialism, but at the same time. It, is, it recognizes the power and destruction of settler colonialism. So having that question of, well, the Zionists have historical facts, and it's important for us to assert historical facts, that kind of modality, I think, is not necessarily constructive. And it's not necessarily a politics that creates or maintains this kind of common discussion. So I think what we can do is try to think together aloud about what are the kind, okay, what are the kind of questions how can we frame these questions? I think more, really far more interesting for me is having this opportunity amongst people from all these different places um, who are working um, towards the same notion of justice that I'm working towards and coming together and figuring out how we can ask questions because that's really what's important. Everything else is sort of goes along, but if we understand how to frame the questions, and part of that is understanding how we haven't necessarily done it in the, in the way that is the most inclusive up until now. And I, I hear I've talked for too long. I have a lot more to say. So I just wanted to just finally say just two last words for everybody that has come today and everybody that has come from near and far. I, from the deepest depths of my heart, I want to thank you for being here and for staying here in your souls and for promising to come back and leave here. Bob should go last because I know she has a lot of really important things to say. I, I'm, I'm going to be really brief. Um, besides, just I, I'm, I I'm just feel like I'm getting darker in the glow of today. You know, I mean, I'm getting you know rich color. Um, both being up here with my friends and also meeting new friends, and it was, it was a wonderful, uh, very inspiring conference. Um, and let me just, I just want to jump in very quickly on three things. Because uh, I don't have any like, closing remarks, but I just want to remark on a, a few things. Uh, one, um, this goes back to the question of commons, or the commons, and the question that was raised about the relationship between uh, property and land, which is not necessarily the same thing. And, and uh, Rana was, you know, made a very important point that in 1856, <coughs> land becomes a commodity. I just want to say a little bit about that because um, one of the places where indigenous studies actually challenges settler colonial studies is in the question of what is, how property comes into being. If you think of land as property, you, you've lost. Mm -hmm. And so, in some ways, Daniela was absolutely right on point by talking about the way indigenous people see themselves as caretakers of the land, products of the land. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different way of thinking. Um, and, that, and once you think of, of being a caretaker of the land, then the question of ownership is, is shifts. It's not about who's going to own it, you know? And that gives, puts us back to Europe, because one of the things that I've always, I've learned from my teacher, Cedric Robinson, is that much of what we think of as colonialism begins in Europe <coughs> itself. And so imagine what it meant to have land held um, in the common, and that much of the dispossession within Europe itself, whether it's the Irish or in the English countryside, was about the dispossession of peoples who had access to land held in common. And so, the, so when, when John Locke in the New World is making these claims about how indigenous peoples uh, don't have a right to the land because they don't, they don't make it productive, he's also having a fight with the levelers in England, saying, you know, he, he's saying that the idea of restoring the commons is a violation of kind of liberal ideology. And so I just want us to come back to that because, you know, I, I, it, it, to, to recognize that is to recognize that the development of colonialism on a global scale 
wasn't a creation of the singular, um, you know, white subject, just kind of out of whole cloth, but that class struggles and stuff, and indigenous struggles were produced um, in, inside of Europe itself. Um, secondly, um, I, I just, I was, of course, I always move when um, Black for Palestine speaks. The presentation was great. Um, the struggle in New Orleans is a very important struggle, and I think people should read up on it. Um, and one of the things I was going to just sort of tag on to that was, some of you may know about the Movement for Black Lives policy statement. And, one of the, and I know that you, they're probably going to talk about that right out of time, but one of the things that happened was because they had in the policy statement uh, a very powerful statement, um, an anti-Zion statement that talked about uh, the oppression of Palestinians as genocide, it was like the Zionists and the liberals came out and basically disavowed the entire document, attacked the entire document on the basis of that. And, and this is one of the strategies that I think, you know, really undermined what was probably the most radical, most powerful transformative statement of policy produced in North America in, in decades, where what they tried to imagine was the, was the creation of uh, ending war, ending war on black people, ending war on indigenous people, ending war on, around the globe, and to take that peace dividend from the end of war, the end of incarceration, you know, and then reinvest that into, the, into transformative policies. Um, and so that's one of the things that got lost, of course, and yet is still with us. And the final thing, that leads me to the last point, which is to tie to both Rana, uh, Rana's points that she made so, so brilliantly, as well as the idea of the individual, indivisibility of justice and the question of capitalism, I want to go back to the Komahi River collective statement uh, and just say a couple things about it because, you know, we often see it as a statement about intersectionality, and it is that. Um, but they called for race, they, what they did not call for, what they did not <coughs> insist on, was a kind of race and gender integrated social democracy. Um, but rather, they were calling for a disordering of racist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy and the remaking of whole, whole of life, of sending life on multiple forms of reproduction and, and body and pleasure. Um, and they were arguing that a non-racist, non-sexist society could not be created under capitalism, period. Mm -hmm. That part of the, the, the collective statement always we could talk about, they were not, they were anti-capitalist. Um, nor, and they argued, nor could socialism alone dismantled the structures of racial, gender, and sexual domination. So the struggle wasn't just a public fight in the streets or a public fight for representation, uh, nor was it just socialism de defined by providing resources in a very public way, you know, like decent jobs, collective labor. But what they also demanded was both complete transformation in the way that Fanon was thinking about complete transformation, disordering the society, and they demanded solidarity with others from others, and a commitment to solidarity with others. That's an important reminder for those who argue that um, the nature of anti-blackness does not afford solidarity with others. They demanded it and insist upon it at, at every level. So I'll stop there, and I'll just pass it on to Thank you. I don't know where to begin, but I want to again reiterate how um, incredible it is to actually be at Birzeit University and to be here in Palestine at home and to have been able to make it. It's really amazing and, it's, and I'm really grateful for all the sisters and brothers, the comrades who were able to make it here today. And I was struck, I'm going to just make a couple of uh, comments about the conference itself. I was really struck by the speech of the president of Birzeit University. And I was trying to imagine, how would that have been had the president of my own university actually made this statement and began to speak about the student, Omar, who was kidnapped and in prison now. The president of my university instead issued the statement welcoming Zionists to campus, to our own campus. He did not ask any of us. There was no democratic governance. 
the Senate of the universe did not have discussion and vote on it. He went and said it on his own. And at the same time, I'm being asked by the university to add, to add for identification purposes only. When I spoke, criticizing the statement and demanding a retraction, and saying that we need to reclaim the social justice mission of our university. And I said, okay, I will issue for identification purposes, and if my president issues for identification purposes only, using the website of the university. And as a result of this, and before, we have been really criminalized. And what, what Enrico was saying about the University of Washington was very similar to what's, happen what, what's been happening at San Francisco State in terms of uh, protesting a racist speaker who comes to campus. And why would the campus even invite? And if the campus invites, and you find out that somebody who's racist came already and invited, why would you apologize and re-invite them again? Okay, the first time is a mistake. What about the second time? The second time you should really know. Okay, in Arabic we have a saying that I wouldn't repeat. That when you repeat things, people are supposed to learn. And you think the university president would learn, but anyway. So, uh, the other thing is the question of also the question of the know your rights, which was very similar to what has happened there, and I will leave it at that. So that was one of the things I also, one of the things that is really amazing is the hospitality we've been receiving. That this is a university, that's a struggling university. This is a struggling, this is a national university in the sense of national not being national in the form of nationalisms as a, a, a la European nationalism, this is an anti-colonial space. Uh, so when we talk about national liberation movements, it's a very different understanding. And this is why we teach Palestine. This is why we understand. This is why we complicate things. And I'm not contradicting what Han is saying about Palestine not being complicated in terms of justice and injustice, but in terms of really needing to understand the texture. Because sometimes Palestine gets to be fetishized. Sometimes Palestine gets to be idealized. Sometimes Palestinians are put on a pedestal. Sometimes it's very tall order for us to live up to the, to the mold in which people who are in support of Palestine put us into. And sometimes Palestinians ourselves also put ourselves in a, on a pedestal that's very difficult to live up to. And that's not always reflective of the reality. So it's very always a balancing act. And I'm not saying a balancing act as a compromise. And I'm not talking about pragmatism. And I'm not talking about what would work and what doesn't work. That's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about really strategically thinking about a balancing act of where is it we begin to be critical and we need to be critical all the time in our own studies, in our own scholarship, in our own pedagogy, and in our own relationship with the communities to which we are accountable within and outside of all our working places, whether we are teaching formally, informally, in all places, and we were talking with the delegation, and I kept saying that last delegation, we were here two years ago, in 2016, Palestinian prisoners was focusing on prison. Palestinian prisoners kept telling people from the US, prison is a university. Prison is a university. And at the Najah National University, one of the, every single professor who spoke, actually, there was a former prisoner. And so one of the professors who spoke, Sami Kelani, uh, whom I've met in 2005, but I did not know this was what he was doing. He was in prison, and his job was editing the newsletter of the prison. And they had to create the newsletter every single day, or every single week, whenever it was, I don't remember. And they had to make sure that it's menu-graphed, and smuggled with the food in the breakfast when prisoners go and pass out the meals in the morning. So every prisoner gets the newsletter. And so when we think about that, this is part of teaching Palestine. This is about the production of, uh, of knowledge. This is part of justice knowledge, uh, justice-centered knowledge production. That it's very important for us to take it into consideration when we think about teaching. And when we think about teaching, it's important to think about not only about teaching in the sense of kind of like what the syllabus is, the masaf, and what exams we, we assign, and we, whether we assign exams or we don't assign exams, and so on. But it's about what does this mean? What does this mean in general? How we approach our subject and so on. So I was thinking about a number of issues. Uh, about what, you know, just to start, you've, you're asking me a bit about how the project itself. And one of the reasons we really started the project was one of the reasons to shift the discourse around the 100 years, 50 years, all these anniversaries last year. 
to kind of start people thinking about not only talking about the occupation, when they say the occupation, they say 50 years and they only start from 67. And not only they forget about the 1948 Nakba, but they also don't think about the 100 years or over 100 years and so on. And to think about the various anniversaries that happened. So it was the 10 year of the blockade of Gaza. Okay. And so how do you deal with that? If you come from different political backgrounds and how you have a different relationship to 2006-2007 in Gaza and the Palestinian elections, how do you think about Sabra and Shatila and what's the current situation in Lebanon today between Palestinians and Lebanese and the historical relationship? How do we think about what does Nakba mean? And what does it mean if we, do we fetishize these anniversaries? Do we fetishize? How do we pay respect to the victims of the Deir Yassin massacre? That 70th anniversary is coming up. And at the same time, not end up only talking about Palestinians being good victims, because a lot of the times when there are uh, people who are doing superficial solidarity, they love good victims. And good victims are dead victims, because dead victims don't speak. Victims who are dead don't speak. And victims who are alive speak for themselves, and they have agency, and they articulate. And sometimes it's not very convenient to the people who would like to do solidarity, because it, doesn't, it just doesn't fit in the package, because people who are in the struggle haven't received the memo of how they are supposed to clean up their discourse, because that doesn't work for the messaging, for the PR messaging, that's supposed to be light on Palestine, that's supposed to give a couple of human rights things, so in order for people to feel sorry and <coughs> express light solidarity with the Palestinians, and maybe fill out a few public opinion polls, but then when it really push comes to shove, and the struggle reaches a, at a point where people, the conditions are imposed upon them to have different kinds of uh, struggle and resistance, then you don't find people. So one of the cases has been kind of like thinking about it in the classroom. I'm teaching, I teach a course called Palestine Ethnic Studies Perspective. And I've been teaching since I've been at San Francisco State. I've designed the course in 2000. Actually, my first teaching job at the American University in Cairo as somebody who finished the PhD. My first teaching job was here at BRZ, Introduction to Women's Studies in 1998, in Arabic, which was a very huge challenge for me because I thought I studied the material in English. But when I went, it was one of the cases, was a few weeks ago, the case of Ahad Tamimi. Because on one hand, people <coughs> want to fetishize Ahad Tamimi and think of her as really great and so on. But it is a very pro big problem, challenge, how to remake Ahad Tamimi, how to reinvent Ahad Tamimi, to make her a young girl who's a victim. To, do we highlight the fact that she's light hair and blue eyes? Do we, we undermine that? Do we highlight the fact that she wears western clothing, she's not wearing a hijab? If she wore a hijab, how would she be seen? If she didn't wear a hijab, what? And, and then, is it she went and she slapped an Israeli soldier? So she, did she slap the Israeli soldier because she had to? Was she over emotional and so on? And it reminds me of Beatrice Spivak's article. Does the subtle speak? Because she talks about that woman who was going to assassinate Gandhi, and then she and then she actually made sure that woman made sure she wasn't on her menstruation cycle. So no, well, nobody would say she was PMSing. I mean, she made sure she still read as an emotional female who went to do something to avenge her own uh, relatives. Not because she actually felt a sense of collective responsibility and being, being part of the collective body. So even the framing of how do we think about the cases we think in Palestine, and Palestine becomes actually, in this sense, becomes a bit more difficult. In other places, such as European places, it, I, don't, I haven't seen it being so difficult in third world uh, context, I haven't seen it as being so complicated in indigenous communities or in communities of color. Because sometimes people identify, they hear it, they know about injustice and kind of like, yeah, of course, makes sense, what's the big deal? It's just, why are you even asking the question? And I think that's the question that we need to ask also, that when we are teaching Palestine, when we are studying Palestine, whether we are in the classroom or we are in the movement <coughs> or in public domain, when people ask us a question, why do we have to answer the question on the terms that are being asked? Why aren't we even challenging the very terms, which is in itself an epistemological question? Why are we answering the questions? The terms of the debate are imposed upon us. We are already defined before we even enter the field. And I'm talking about now we in the collective, we in terms of people who come from oppressed, marginalized communities. You don't have a choice. I mean, when you have a relationship with power, 
Power decides. And when we were coming to cross the bridge, when people were asking what should we expect, I said we could expect everything because power is unpredictable. And that's one of the features of power, that it can afford to be unpredictable. It is not an accidental or an isolated thing or spontaneous or something. It's actually part of the in inherent features of power that is unpredictable. It doesn't have to answer. It doesn't really have to. And it actually chooses to be flexible because it can change the rules as it goes along whenever it wants. I mean, this is the way it works. So why do we have to accept even the terms of the debate, the terms of the battle, the terms of the fight? All of these issues, I think, become really important for us to question and think about what is said. And this also applies to the movement and who constitutes, who speaks for the Palestinians, who speaks for whom, which Palestinians, about what, how do we speak, what language we clean up, how do we look like polite, nice, presentable people for the soundbite, and when is it we need the soundbite and when we don't? And how is it that we can move from different spaces, from the classroom, and I'm talking about the classroom formally or informally, including at the coffee shop, at the center of the street, when we are riding public transformation, sometimes even the mere look with each other, we have the identification. We know what we're talking about. And you look around and you know. You know if you get attacked, who's going to have your back. You sort of know. You know. And you do not know because it's instinctual. You know because it is instinctual because it is part of the lived experiences. And how do you account for the lived experiences? And this is where the question of oral histories and the stories of my grandmother and my grandfather and my brother and my walk and getting home if you don't live in Birzeh through the checkpoint and not knowing if the student is going to be able to make the exam or not. I, and I remember many times I have never had a full class in Birzeh. Even when I was teaching intro to women's studies. All the time, where is this? This person is arrested by the Palestinian Authority. This person is arrested by Israel. This person is delayed because of this. And sometimes it's also the conditions are because there is lack of, lack of money, there is the taxi is not there. There is all sorts of things that are complicated by these conditions that also how can we lessen the devaluing of life when it is not direct impact of the military power that's occupying and controlling our lives as opposed to maybe it's an economic or other forms. How do we think about the whole criminalization business and how do we think, and last year we had a lot of discussion two years ago about abolition, prison abolition, and what does prison abolition mean? Because in Palestine people talk about political prisoners. There is a movement in the US for prison abolition completely, not just political prisoners. And so people will discuss it and we will get to the point where people are very open to it and then we get to the question of collaborators. And that's where the discussion stops. And it's not wrong or right on either side. It's a, it's a discussion that again points out to our discussion earlier about the whole question of indigeneity and uh, African Americans and the whole question that the, the, the kidnapping and the enslavement of African Americans and how do we think about all those relations. The context is really important. It takes me to the context of anti-blackness. And how do we even understand anti-blackness in the United States and in the Western Hemisphere and in places where slavery is institutionalized based on skin color, not institutionalized only, institutionalized based on skin color, when skin color becomes the measure for valuing or not valuing of human life. And how does that, is different from different historical contexts in which there is slavery, but it does not, it's not necessarily skin, skin color based. And I think it's really, these are some of the questions that we really need to talk about. Well, if we want to talk about solidarities, if we want to talk about moving forward, if we want to talk about interlocking systems, if we want to, we need to talk about all, all, all of these questions. The, um, okay, I discussed the inter, and the, the, the very fear comes up. The, the other point that I thought this was actually really interesting to, there was a lot of debate about this Ghada's question about teaching about Jewishness and Zionism and so on. And I really don't think it's about whether to teach or not, because we have to teach. It's the question is when we teach, who is at the center of analysis? Who is at the center and who is, gets decentered? There is one way to teach Zionism, and very interesting because we had the Teaching Palestine session at the Middle East Studies Association that was attended by a professor from Hebrew University, Hillel Cohen. And he came and he was talking about his experience of teaching, how a lot of his students served in the Israeli military, and there's about 15% of the Palestinians, and he said, I do not say that Zionism is not a legitimate project. I just say, talk about it. 
And I think somebody in the audience challenged him to say, but that's that's question of injustice. And he said, well, if I do that, then I will lose half of my students. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I mean, I didn't have a chance. It wasn't because I was co-moderating the panel, but I didn't have a chance. I was going to say to him, so what? So what if you lose half of your students? I mean, if they are unable to live and actually be challenged and so on and continue perpetuating settler colonialism and racism, they need to leave. Okay, so I think this is, it, it, this is all these questions, the question of who's at the center of analysis. And are we teaching as, like let's say in Palestinian context and in people who are teaching Palestine as well, are we teaching to decolonize knowledge or are we teaching because we are internally colonized and we want to be, okay? So the last, uh, the last point is I wanted to mention is the question of why the delegation. It's not every year, <coughs> actually. For me, it's every two or three years. Because what happens is I have to forget about how much work it takes for me to do it again. And it's, I mean, it's just a pleasure. It's such a pleasure when we get here. And when I see, and for me, why do I do it? Because I always think that it is really how amazing it would be for people in Palestine and for people in the other communities in which I am, I am either... I belong to, or I collaborate with, or I feel that's part of my kin, to be able to have these conversations. How can we do that? Is this possible? It, it, would, it doesn't happen, it wouldn't happen in the US because of the mobility issue. It doesn't, I mean, it's very hard. It's only a certain number of people can go, and then sometimes they don't get visas, and sometimes you put an empty chair, but the empty chair is only symbolic. You protest, but it doesn't really respond to having somebody to deliver the comments. Because, and because also, this also speaks to the whole question of all, all these attacks against us, they're all defensive mechanisms. So we're involved in actually reacting and responding and defending. But at the end of the day, they are all placed, put on the terms of the people who are colonizing, who are oppressing, who are trying to silence us, who are trying to criminalize us, and so on. It is not the productive projects that we want to. And for me, this teaching Palestine is a, that we're, we're setting the terms. We are saying, what do we include in it, what do we not include, what do we discuss today, what do we discuss tomorrow. And one of the things that I really would, wanted us to, to have today, and you know, we don't have a lot of time, also primarily because I'm speaking a lot, and I will end in a minute. But having discussion for the people, like everybody who spoke, I thought that we can actually have two, three hours after the presentation just to ask, just to ask questions, even before we have discussion and debate and critical. Uh, analysis, but it's it's uh, uh, it, it, this is this is something that it actually like very pleasurable and it's really great to be able to have people and this is also it's also very reciprocal. This is not a question of solidarity tourism, and you really don't need to go to Palestine for you to understand justice and injustice because if it only involves having to see with your own eyes. How do you talk about the thousands of people who are supposed to support justice without having to go? You don't have to go to see it, and you don't have to materially experience it. And you will never be a refugee, even if you stay in refugee camps and so on. You only inconvenience the people that you stay in their homes and so on. And this is my own, my own take on what you do with delegations and so on. And I think it costs more, but I, I, it's, it's, it's a way to kind of like have... Uh, exchanges, co-learning, learning with each other, having discussions and so on, that does not create, does not turn the people who are on delegations as consumers of Palestinian suffering or Palestinian heroism, okay, or in between, there is a big continuum. And it doesn't also turn the Palestinians into also people who only celebrate whenever people come from the outside and talk to them and so on, because it's sort of like, something exotic, novice. It actually allows for us to have these critical discussions that we really need to have. But it also depends who is on the delegation. So I am totally against delegations that anybody who can pay money should get to go. I believe that we have to have some kind of gatekeeping mechanism. I mean, I really do. I think it's just exactly the same way you do research. If you do unethical research, you can just go. You can go to Harlem, for example, well, before now, now, before Robin Kelly wrote his article about gentrification and the gentrification of Harlem. But you could go to Harlem 
and you can just go. You can come and go. Nobody stops you. You can go to Shatila refugee camp. Anybody can land in Tel Aviv and just come and visit and do whatever they want. And I think there is a problem. There has to be a sense of responsibility. There has to be a sense of accountability, both for the people who are visiting and for the people who are receiving. So I think Palestinians are very hospitable, but I think at some places people shouldn't be so hospitable. I think at some point it's a question of what are you going to do, why are you here, what are you doing here, what is it that you're going to do after you return, what kind of accountability and obligation that you will get to have after you return, and how long is going to last? I mean, so, and it's not how long it's going to last, it's going to take you over your life. You return back and then you become full time 100% Palestinian solidarity activist. Because that means that you didn't have a life before. And that's actually a problem for people with looking for a cause, rather <coughs> without a cause, who are looking for a cause. Because that also causes fetishization and that causes idealization and so on. So I think for me, this is the idea of kind of like thinking. We actually turned down a lot of people just so the, from, and it wasn't, we had a, a, a review committee, but there were also people that we really, really wanted to have. So Madonna Thunderhawk from the Standing Rock, who, was, who is one of the elder women at Standing Rock and was one of the founders of the American Indian Movement back in the 60s and actually hosted the PLO in Standing Rock in the 60s, really wanted to be here. And so did Elizabeth Castle, who is making a film about the warrior women at Standing Rock. It was both the question of lack of funding, which also makes us ask, who funds, aside from people who are funding themselves, who funds delegations, and to what extent, and where does the money go, and how do we deal with it, and how can we stretch the charges? Because also this is part of knowledge, this is part of teaching Palestine, and learning about Palestine, and producing the visibility of justice. But also because they are facing trials now, and Madonna almost lost her house because they are they are being prosecuted. Because, and it was very interesting that after Trump was elected, the Muslim ban, everybody protested the Muslim ban, and people stopped struggling around Standing Rock, and it was like shocking because Muslim ban was all over the news, and Standing Rock wasn't in the news, and people basically abandoned a community that was in a freezing uh, weather, flooded. There is a lot of illnesses were going, there were no medical uh, support and so on, because when it was sexy, everybody flocked to Standing Rock. And then when it was no longer sexy, people disappeared. And uh, my, one of my interests is that, how do we make the question about commitments to Palestine as part of justice and other justice, make it long term? And then the last question is then, who becomes part of this long term? Which communities, which are people of which communities are more likely to actually engage and be supportive of Palestine in a long-term basis, and which communities are going to come and go and jump in and jump out when there is an Occupy movement, and when there is no Occupy movement, people will drop out because today this is the cause of the day, that tomorrow would be very nice to talk about at cocktail parties and at socials and so on. <coughs> but it's an optional that people enter. And, so I'm not saying that only people who are very oppressed participate in the survey. I don't believe in that. I do believe that people make choices and decide that they are going to be part of the complicity or they're going to be part of justice. But I think it is a part of commitment and a part of way of life that imposes things upon us who are living abroad in the diaspora, those of us who are diasporic Palestinian, and people who are in other diasporas or not in diasporas, or don't define their lives as diaspora. And it poses itself upon also Palestinians who are living here. What sort of life they have, when they, what they choose to use, what goods they choose, who they choose to host or not to host. When do you make the decision to actually say to maybe a big shot professor, which Birzet has done many times and it's really amazing, no, sorry, we're not going to receive you because you've been fraternalizing and normalizing Israeli occupation. Sorry. Go and come back through Jordan or come back only for a visit in Palestine and we will receive you. This happened multiple times and I know the history. This is also part of teaching and learning Palestine if we think about Palestine as a Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a chance to open up the discussion. This is a discussion that's going to be going on for the next four or five days amongst everybody, but 
this is the Beer Zate stop of this discussion. So, Twabba. Say your name. I have a problem, uh, not for the long, long struggle, but for the imminent moment. Uh, we have an authority which is collaboration with the Israelis. And we are passing a very critical stage of finalizing the solution of the Palestinian problem. And that is transfer. I, I went one time for the court against Mahmoud Abbas for a constitutional problem, but they said this is not our specialization. And I'm thinking of going back to the court just to, to prove something that these judges are not really uh, honest. What can we do? What, what we can do, I mean, of, of your studies and your research concerning uh, fighting your cause. Thank you. Okay. Let's open up the discussion. So, me? No? Well, I think yeah, maybe that's going to be an impetus to open up a further discussion because I think this is where history does matter. Um, uh, you know, the, the, just a quick history of the PLO, you obviously don't need, but just for the rest of the room and to contextualize the question that you asked was that, you know, it's a, it's a longer history than the, than the PA. Um, and in the last you know, 20 years, since 1993, 94, 95, with the construction of the Palestinian Authority, it's been sort of within Palestinian culture, it's been this sort of, the PA is meant to, in cultural and local terms, to erase the past of the PLO, right? And we can see the results of that in the discussion that we were having this afternoon about the Oslo generation, which is what a lot of those professors were talking about. Um, uh, and I think that's a really important thing to talk about. I think one of the things that we can do when we teach, and this is one of the things that I try to do, it's one of the reasons that I came here, to be, to be honest with you, is that um, that sense of erasure just seems more vital and raw to me here than it did anywhere else, with all due respect to wherever everybody's coming from. Um, and so when, when I teach, I don't have the same discussions that some of those professors this afternoon had, because... Um, I try not to approach my students as the Oslo generation and as robots that are a product of what the, what, the, what the authority wanted to create. But I do see this vacuum. I see that they have no sense of relations with the politics around them, which is exactly what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. you know, the PA doesn't represent them. It doesn't represent me, right? It doesn't represent us. It certainly doesn't re represent a struggle for liberation. We can have an argument about whether the PLO did or not, but at least that was a discussion. Um, and the PA, it's not a discussion. So I think, when I try to talk about this, let's bring this back into what settler colonial frameworks look like, right? So the PA, it's not a surprise. It is part and parcel of what settler colonialism is, right? They just want to have um, local, it's just a proxy power. Right? So it's, if we understand the power and how that sort of structural violence works within settler colonial context, we can understand what the PA is. Um, we put it under that framework, and it's not a part of the epistemological questions that we're asking with regards to Palestine and Palestinian history, because that's a settler colonial sort of category. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean in the existential sense that you're asking? That's a really important question. I don't worry as much about it, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, maybe it's because I'm divorced from reality. But it's, you know, Abu Mazen has been talking about this for years, and I think the one thing that worries me is that he's lived this long. Um, I know that's a horrible thing to say, but it's true. And you know, he doesn't have anything new to offer. And I, I think you're right in the fact that they're talking about a final solution. But every time the settler, every time a settler colonial state tries to offer a final solution, it is going to be genocide. It's going to be structural genocide. There's nothing a settler does besides try to eliminate the existence of an indigenous population. That's been the case since the beginning of settler colonialism in Palestine, and that's been the case since 
Columbus's journey. And that's the history of modernity. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if yesterday or tomorrow or the day after that, and yet another Zionist says that Palestinians don't exist and they never will exist. And they'll try to violently transfer us again like they did in 48. But that's ongoing. That never stopped. That violence that began with the first settler settlements here and that turned up a notch with the state hasn't ever stopped. So if we're going to be worried, the worry is a 70-year-long worry. It's not anything new, I think. And I think that's one of the things that I was trying to talk about. That's the comment. Right? There's nothing extraordinary about Zionist settler colonialism. It's actually not so extraordinary, except for the fact that it was in the 20, 20th century and the 21st century. I don't know. I think, I believe, as a Palestinian, Palestinian I'm sure as a Palestinian, as a Palestinian I've, I've, I've said that there was a conference at Masarat in 2013. Yeah. I said we should dismantle Oslo. That should be the demand, dismantle Oslo. The thing is, is that even people who believe in dismantling Oslo awesome. are so embedded no in the Oslo, they are embedded and benefiting as a result of the Oslo structure. People are hired in the ministries. People have the loans because of the way it is. There is all this structure. There is a whole structure that's created. And if people would like to really do that, there is going to be a lot of losses to be made in order for people to make that a way of life. I mean, it really requires a lot of sacrifices. The question is, are people who are, to, you know, like discussing it, theorizing about it, mentioning it, the Palestinian opposition, the Palesti Palestinians who don't agree with that, aside from the people who are actually resisting day in and day out, because this is what's keeping Palestinians alive, where are, where are the forces? I mean, this is, I believe, in terms of social movement analysis even, this is a very right moment for things to shift qualitatively. Yeah. Things to shift qualitatively. Mm -hmm. Except there is no leadership mm -hmm. to lead the shifting. 2011, when the Arab revolutions were happening, people were talking about a third Palestinian intifada. I don't like one, two, three, because mm -hmm. it eliminates all the struggle from the past. Mm -hmm. Because there was multiple advisors and it's uprisings, including 1936-39, which was amazing. But I think that 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 when people talked about that, it fizzled away. There were possibilities. People, even the taxi drivers, were protesting. There was all these kind of protests that were going on, and they were diffused because people's livelihoods are very much tied in to the structure of Oslo. And I'm not talking about the ordinary people's livelihood because it's always. People are always in South African anti-apartheid movement. The anti the, the, the people who support the apartheid used to say, oh, if we do that, it's going to hurt African uh, black uh, workers. Kosato said the message, please hurt us and boycott. Please do not patronize us. We know what we want. Just go ahead and boycott. The same discussion is getting, coming up now. It's going to hurt Palestinian workers. I mean, since when you care about Palestinian workers, all of a sudden you care about Palestinian workers. So it is the question of how the, how the question is posed. And who is going, what, how is the theory going to be translated into praxis? Not only theoretically and in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. So it really depends on all the forces, al hirak al people are saying, talking about that. Unless people are willing to do it or a new leadership emerges, it's, it's going to be the same thing. It's dead, but it's alive. Right, but that's, I mean, that's um, Mamraya, Mamraya, or Mamira, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. Um, that's exactly what your paper was, and those are, I mean, I have, I have two students who I'm trying to urge to get to work on the Haitian example. There's just not enough stuff in Arabic, to be honest with you. Um, but the first black republic really excites them. And what you were talking about today blew my mind when you were talking about it's not a failed state. The, fate, the state is doing exactly what it's mandated to do, which is the NGOs of NGOization. So... Palestine's not the, well, the experience, yani, the, 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 yani, the, the kind of um, connections between class conflict, this new sense of a bourgeoisie conflict. This is the new bourgeoisie is exactly what Rabab is talking about. That's, there are other sites for this. It's happening in other sites. And I think not only can I learn a lot from what's happening in Haiti, to be honest with you, a great deal. I can also learn a lot from being in conversation with somebody like you who's working on this in Haiti. I'm not saying that I have an answer, but when you were talking about the left, I thought you were talking about Palestine. Um, not because because these are the same corp uh, these are corporations. These are the same funders that are that have that are funding here. And I don't think that's I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's actually meant to be. 
So when we talk about the, the PA, I think that there's a conversation to be, to be said about what you meant about a failed state and not a failed state. The PA is doing exactly what it was meant to do. That's not liberating Palestine, but that's like, they're doing what they were meant to do. And I like, it's just, what's hard, to be honest with you, is that there needs to be more, <laughs> this is my urging of you, there just needs to be more sort of